<laughs> we still joke about that to this day. So I have to read this letter. This is, a, this is an actual letter. During the All-Star break, team CEO Larry Lucchino wrote a letter to Red Sox season ticket holders asking them to keep the faith. It was a PR attempt gone terribly wrong. We have watched the team coalesce into a close group. Personalities are enhancing the chemistry, such as the cheerful Cody Ross, <laughs> the friendly Mike Aviles, and the inspiring story of Daniel Nava. Jared Saltalamacchia has shown power in the clutch, worthy of an all-star. Now they're picking the all-star team. And as the talented Will Middlebrook forced his way into the lineup, we bade farewell with gratitude to Kevin Euclid, who helped us win two world championships. Who wrote, who wrote this, Grantland Rice? That one is sort of an all-timer for just absurdity. Cheerful Cody Ross, like, okay, let's go watch Cheerful Cody Ross. I kind of was the only real bright spot. And, you know, I, so, I, you know, I was not happy because we weren't winning by, by any means. And I, it was a miserable um, kind of experience as far as a, as a team goes. The one constant off the field is that we have had a veritable all-star team on the disabled list. <laughs> uh. <laughs> this is great. I forgot about this letter. This is the actual letter. I can't believe it. Uh, as we begin the second half, we look forward to the return of the varsity, including Jacoby Ellsbury, Carl Crawford, Andrew Bailey, and the ever dirty Dustin Pedroia. Here's the best part. Keep the faith, Larry Lucchino. You can't make this up, man. That, that, that's the real letter. That's sort of shorthand for clueless Red Sox uh, ham-handed attempts at controlling the message, controlling the narrative. Uh, they failed, as they often do. Just a real letter. <laughs> by a major league organization that, that has won championships. Like, this is not an uh, expansion team. This is not uh, a, a perpetual loser. At that point, 2000, 2012, yeah, this, team had won, uh, this team had won two championships. They knew it wasn't a Mickey Mouse, you know, like Yahoo market. Uh, you know, people, are like, people aren't going to buy that. What were they thinking? Throughout the entire letter, there wasn't one mention of Bobby Valentine. John pitched great, offense stunk. That's it. There's no more bull questions or anything. Frustration was escalating after the All-Star break as the team was stuck in neutral, unable to climb up in the standings. It wouldn't be long before another controversy with the manager. I don't know how to define toxic. It's too big a word for me. It was already kind of brewing, but I think a turning point for me that I really sticks out in my head that um, bothers me, and I think that's really kind of when he 100% lost all the players is when you had Lester on the mound. July 22nd, 2012. The Red Sox were a game over 500, but Valentine left the struggling John Lester in the game against the Toronto Blue Jays. The lefty allowed a career-high 11 runs in a 15-7 loss. Normally, a manager wouldn't allow one of his best players to be embarrassed like that. He left a guy that's, you know, your ace, um, who's done everything for this team, who's been a grinder, in essence, your heart and soul of your starting rotation, and you leave him out there to give up 14, 15 runs um, instead of protecting him. So I think that's when every player was like, you know what, this guy's definitely not there to protect us and watch after us, so we got to do our own thing. The players took matters into their own hands after an incident less than a week later. Valentine was texting his coaches on a flight about which pitcher should be demoted to the minor leagues. The problem is it was a group text with all my coaches and also the two catchers on the team, Salta Lamacchia and Kelly Shopik. And so immediately Salta Lamacchia comes up from the back of the plane. And he says, hey, Skip, I don't know if I was supposed to be on this text. And I looked and I said, oh, thanks, Salta. You weren't supposed to be on this text. The other catcher, Kelly Shopik, took a much different approach. As I looked down the aisle, Kelly Shopik was going around showing the pitchers the text. One of the responses was about Melanson. And one of the coaches said, that curveball doesn't work in this league. And I remember talking to not one of the catchers, but a different player on the team who said, that text message made its way around the entire clubhouse in about 
five seconds. Every player on the team knew it. And now, so they know this is how he talks about us behind our backs to the other coaches. Pretty soon after that, maybe the bus ride after we got off the plane, there was the decision that I didn't know how to text. Bobby may not have known how to text, but his players did. Kelly Shopik used Adrian Gonzalez's phone to text owner John Henry. They wanted the message coming from the phone of the highest paid player on the team. They were fed up with Valentine and wanted a private meeting with ownership. I'll never forget that meeting. It was one of the most craziest things I've ever been a part of in my life. The meeting in July was obviously a very divisive thing. The players didn't want it to get out. It did get out. And it highlighted the principal concern with Bobby Valentine that the players had, which was he is causing the distractions. The whole team was there about, you know, how everyone wanted Bobby gone. The guys walked, got up and said their piece and said, hey, this guy's got to go. And we, we, we don't want him here. Um, it's not working. We can't, you know, we don't want to play for him. It all started in, in April with, in the media calling out guys, which you throw guys under the bus, that's where that connection is uh, starts getting a little fuzzy. I think he was over his head because he just didn't realize how much Major League Baseball had changed from a, from a, from a managerial perspective. Usually it's the manager's job to clean up the mess the players are making. The players felt like they were cleaning up Bobby's messes constantly. Valentine's behavior had fans and media wondering if he would even survive the season. It's yep. not true. I'm not trying to get fired, folks. It's not true. It's not that? true. Did you get that? It's all made up by him. It's not true. Bobby's our manager, and we're not considering anyone else. You know, this is the, I know he's, he's as committed to managing the team as he ever has been. Let's not leave ownership out of this. Even when they saw some of the signs, they, they, they interpreted that as, hey, he's an agent of disruption. You know, he's, he's changing it up. Uh, they, he's making guys uncomfortable. We like it. We like it. And, and I think they liked it in April. And I think they liked it in May. And I think they finally figured it out. They heard so many stories, and I think they saw some things that really woke them up. When Valentine learned of the players' meeting with ownership, he called a meeting of his own. I did say some things to some of the leadership group that they probably weren't comfortable with. A couple of guys weren't happy with it, and I get it. You know, I, I get that Josh didn't like me to bring his name up in a meeting, and, and maybe I shouldn't have. But I was, I was at wit's end. You have to understand, I, I was getting uh, very little support. By this time, the, the coaches were fighting. The players could feel the season slipping away and they felt like the manager was the cause of it. He was the cause of so much stress and distress and distrust, and so they wanted to address it. Obviously, it went nowhere. Management stuck by their man, and to this day, I really don't understand why they didn't pull the plug on Bobby, whether it was July or August. They wrote it out till the end. Tragedy struck Red Sox Nation in August. Legendary player and franchise icon Johnny Pesky died at the age of 92. Pesky played eight seasons in Boston as a teammate of Ted Williams, spent many seasons as a Boston coach, served as a team ambassador for years, and has his number retired by the team. Me personally, I appreciate all, all, this, all this great time that I uh, spent with Mr. Johnny. So we're going to miss him a lot. He always wanted to help people, and um, you know, that's why he was so special to everybody. What he's done to this, this organization, let alone what he's done in baseball, um, you know, he's a legacy that's you know, never going to be forgotten. Pesky was synonymous with the Red Sox, but only four players from the roster attended his funeral. David Ortiz, Clay Buckholtz, Vicente Padilla, and Jared Saltalamacchia. I've always been a historian of the game. I've always respected the game. I mean, obviously, Pesky's legacy was, you know, far greater than most players. I mean, he was larger than life. And, you know, so I wanted to pay my respect to a guy that built, you know, what I was able to go out and play every day and um, be a part of. When it comes down to a funeral situation, I mean, there's not a, there's not a reason why you wouldn't show up when a friend passed away, you know, and, and I, I, I feel like I gotta be there for him and his family. And Johnny Pesky was family, but instead of requiring the team to honor the legend, Red Sox ownership made it optional to attend the funeral. The team had just arrived home from a road trip early in the morning on the day of the service. 
I had a, something in my head just told me that I needed to go, so I went out there. And uh, like I said, I, I feel like if we wouldn't have found out about it at 3.45 in the morning when we got here, there would, there would have been a lot more guys go. You have to honor him. You have to honor him. Current players, former players, the whole organization, it has to be a mandate. This is what we're going to do. Valentine blames the lack of communication throughout the organization for the PR nightmare. In my past life of managing other places, when there was something that needed to be done, I was informed. Make sure you get up early. You got something to do. And I always did it. And, um, you know, to criticize the players, I, I don't know if they knew and said no. I don't think it was a lack of communication and I uh, wasn't, um, my feelings weren't hurt that more guys didn't show up. You know, I think guys have a way of dealing with funerals and, and situations like that differently. So um, who am I to question them? You know, I can only control myself and what I do. And I wanted to be a part of that. It was important to me. So that's why I did it. Making things worse was that a large group from the team attended Josh Beckett's charity bowling event the night of Pesky's funeral. In life, in death, they really struck the proper tone. And then for Johnny Pesky, they blew it. They all blew it. The players blew it. The organization blew it. So yeah, it was a disaster. David is, and probably will be for a long, long time, the face of, of Boston. You know, if you think of Boston Red Sox, you think of David Ortiz. The team revolved around David. You know, I mean, it, it was, he was important. But like most of his teammates, Big Poppy was enduring a frustrating season. It's becoming to be the place I used to be. You know, playing here, you know, used to be so much fun. Now, every day is something new. Not related with baseball, not even related with baseball. People need to leave us alone. I think you really start to lose. Yeah, I, th I thought he, he, I think he started to lose a lot of hope. Ortiz spent almost six weeks on the disabled list with an Achilles injury before returning in late August. The 36-year-old was scheduled to be a free agent after the season. Do you still want to be here after this year? I don't know. I think about it. Ortiz was limited to just 90 games in 2012, his fewest in 14 seasons with the Red Sox. His final game was on August 24th, but that wasn't the biggest news of the day. I don't know if I was angry, confused. I think I was everything. You know, that, that this, all, this all happened in a matter of a few hours. So that was an crazy day for everybody. The Red Sox were finalizing a blockbuster trade with the Dodgers, sending high-priced stars Josh Beckett, Adrian Gonzalez, Carl Crawford, and utility infielder Nick Punto to Los Angeles. The deal saved Boston $250 million, but it completely blindsided the manager. When you talk about a confusing situation, I left my office to go down to the dugout, and I was, I was walking through the clubhouse. A lot of guys were standing around, including Adrian. He was waiting for me as I walked out, and he said, what am I doing in the lineup? And I said, we're just trying to win a game, dude. Let's go. And he says, no, no, I just got traded along with those other guys. And then I said, ah, it's just a rumor. Let's go. He says, no, the Dodgers are sending a plane for us. Even the guys that got traded were blindsided. That's news to me. I don't remember that. So to leave your manager in the dark does surprise me. Valentine was still unsure if the trade was official. But then minutes before first pitch, assistant GM Brian O'Halloran approached him. Well, it's national anthem time. And I walked down the runway to stand for the national anthem, wondering what I had just walked through. And Brian came down and kind of tugged on my jacket and said, come on down. And he had a lineup card in the sand. He says, you got to make out a new lineup. We just made a trade with the Dodgers. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, that really surprised me just because as a manager, you would think you would know a little bit what's going on. Obviously, they don't have to for us to have to talk to the coaches and managers to to make decisions, um, you know, but you would think something like that would have been brought to his attention before he made the lineup or something. The ship had just sailed at that point and, and guys were just ready to get through the season. Everyone was kind of blindsided by that deal. That was like nobody really knew what was going on. And then right then we were like, oh, I guess we're I guess we're going to cash it in now. The trade signaled that Boston was waving the white flag on the season and David Ortiz knew it.
He had just worked his way back to the lineup from an Achilles injury that night, but felt discomfort running the bases. Without a contract for next season, it didn't make sense for Ortiz to push through the pain. David got the hit. I, he went up into the, into the clubhouse. I think John Henry was up there saying goodbye to the players. I was managing the game. The players left. David came down. He said, we're not trying to win anymore. There's no reason for me to play anymore. And I said, uh, well, maybe if you're healthy, maybe you just give it your best shot. He said, if we're not trying to win, Poppy, I'm not playing either. And I got that totally. In a season full of memorable days, this one was unforgettable. He was never able to say goodbye to the players traded to L.A. God, that was the weirdest day of my life. I think, it was the, I think it was the number one weirdest day in my life because by the time I made a pitching change and we were going to have that time for me to go up into the clubhouse and say goodbye and thank the guys, they were already gone. At that point, you're going, all right, well, I guess, I guess that's it for this year. We know we're struggling, but as a professional athlete, eh, you never just want to just give up. And that's what it felt like when we traded big names at that point bobby valentine must have known that i'm not long for this job i'm going to be a one and done guy because the organization is making decisions big time decisions that really for financial relief the fact that they were able to dump so much money that was impossible you know the dodgers basically handed the red sox the world series in 2013. boston can thank los angeles owner and former lakers star magic johnson for helping the Sox get a head start on the 2013 season. Magic Johnson, you broke my heart in the 80s with the little baby hook in 87, but you saved the Red Sox in 2012, so they did us a solid. Call it a draw. Call it a draw. I'd still take the hook back.